discussing immigration and DACA. Not easy when we have no support from the Democrats. Not one dim voted for our tax cut bill. Exclamation point. <laughs> Need more Republicans in 2018. And this is new polling shows. The president and his political party may have the wind at their back when it comes to the new year. The president's job approval now at 42 percent, a big bump from his December low of 32 percent. A majority of Americans, 55 percent, say the president has been at least somewhat successful at getting Congress to pass his legislative agenda, a reversal from December before the tax bill was approved when it was only 42 percent who felt that way. And if the midterm elections were held today, this is interesting. 47% of registered voters say they would vote for or lean toward voting for the Democratic House candidate in their district, compared with 45% who would support the Republican. A dramatic shift from December when Democrats held a whopping 15-point advantage over the generic ballot. Uh, Buck, what's driving this? Well, one, you have tax reform with the benefits of all these different people across the country getting checks, getting raises, and Democrats have really positioned themselves right now as the party of scowls and frowns. We saw <laughs> it at the State of the Union address. We see it any time a Democrat elected representative is asked, what do you think about the $4,000 on average that people have now they didn't before? It's tough to see them saying, well, it's not a lot of money and not think to yourself, these people are really out of touch. Also, if they're completely unwilling to look at Trump seriously on the issue of immigration, given that Trump's offer is is a little bit of a, not a betrayal of his base, but it's not what he promised his base. I think we could say that. If they won't even try to meet him halfway, I think they just become the party of unhappy and obstruction. So two things. I want to draw everybody's attention to the left side of your screen. That is the lectern that we're watching that the president will step up on that stage behind and give his speech to the GOP policy retreat today. As that happens, uh, we'll take you there live. You know what's interesting? Um, let's get back to those crumbs that Nancy Pelosi was talking about. I, I'm a little confused. Well, she is very, 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 very wealthy. Did I say seven? I should have. <laughs> so Trish, I mean, when you talk about who's in touch with the American people, can, can you look at her to determine what is crumbs for everybody else? I'll tell you, Harris, she has become the Marie Antoinette of the Republican Party. She really has, and especially when she's talking about things like crumbs. $1,000 is a lot of money to a lot of people in this country. And I thought the Democrats were about empowering the middle class. I thought they were about trying to grow their economic opportunity. Well, instead, we've got basically someone who's saying what the Republicans are doing right now, which is by the way, growing economic opportunity in a very big way for the middle class, um, is not helping. It's nothing. It's a it, it, thousand bucks is insignificant. Well, she is increasingly out of line with where the rest of the population is. And by the way, this is why Hillary Clinton lost. Let's not forget. She seemed Marie Antoinette like she seemed like she was part of the globalist elitism that was making it harder for everyday people. And this is what Nancy Pelosi is taking on. Jessica? Well, when I think of global elites and I see the entire Trump cabinet prancing around Davos, that certainly brings up a little bit tinge of hypocrisy there. But I'm all for globalism and I think all of that is important and and you are right that Hillary Clinton seemed out of touch and Nancy Pelosi seemed out of touch a thousand dollars is a lot to everybody I don't care who you are and how much money you have actually and it's a it points out a really powerfully messed up messaging issue that Democrats wow. have today. Well, it just does. Even if you think certain things, you don't have to say them. And there's a way, there's an editorial today in the Washington Post by Dana Milbank that I would encourage everyone to look at about how bad the Democrat performance at the State of the Union was and how much more powerful it would be to talk about what's going on with the GOP tax bill but and the implications no for further, layoffs. Jessica, and, than the fact that there were five rebuttal speeches necessary. It just does seem Democrats. like the message from Democrats still is resist Donald Trump, yeah. it's, isn't it time to come up with a new message? I mean, it it's like February that, well, 1st, 2018. It, it seems like that has to be the plan. If they're not going to engage seriously on immigration, which I think was the policy focal point of the speech in terms of what's coming up, what's mm -hmm. uh, in the future, in the near future, probably the next few weeks even, uh, the fact that you haven't had Democrats saying, you know what, that's actually a pretty decent opening offer with Trump. We're going to talk to him about it. They are just standing there, arms crossed. We want nothing to do with it. Donald Trump won based on message and personal style and flair, I guess you could say. If you add on top of that results, which is what we're seeing right now with an economy, yeah. how could Democrats expect to do well in the midterms? I'm just, I'm what, hashtag well, resist is not going to do it except in a few <laughs> major hashtag, hashtag resist has done 
done very well for us in special elections. It absolutely has. I mean, our turnout game, what are you? Yeah. It's one. One, what? right? In Virginia. Which is why, in which is no, why you absolutely. Guys, across across the no, I mean, even Alabama yeah, was, was we would have didn't put up the best candidates. Yeah, so. yeah the child molester is not the best candidate for sure. But we have seen increased turnout and enthusiasm. You had things like the Women's March still going strong. And we do need to make sure that people turn out in 2018. But to your point about the five rebuttals, I had tremendous problems with that. I mean, the party picked Joe well, Kennedy the third the to do it. So I don't know why Bernie Sanders needs to do it. I don't know why. But what was the message? What was of, the of Joe Kennedy Any the of them. Just oh, me. inclusivity, diversity, how much stronger it makes was our country that we message? don't have that we are all equal fundamentally. There's a great piece about it talking about how this is going back to rhetoric from Abraham Lincoln, talking about we are all What's created going to equal. Be important and is we didn't it, see that in the it, State of the Union. Is if they can come up with a message on the economy. They yes. did yes. not do that in the last presidential election <laughs> and it hurt them badly. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They lost a lot of ground because now you have a president that's going to be able to tout a potentially booming economy at the time of midterm elections uh, and, and members of the Republican Party can point to a roaring stock market, jobs growth, people having more money in their paychecks and it's going to be harder. It is. I do wonder why everyone's retiring though. If things are looking so good well, people for People retire for different reasons. Well, these are a lot of committee chairs that are leaving when they are certainly not too old to be there in a very powerful position. Representative Joe Kennedy III on mm -hmm. your side of the political <laughs> aisle was one of those five rebuttal speeches and he even conceded the fact that you know uh, the, the economy is what it is and I mean he said he some should. not glowing words necessarily but positive words about the economy. It's so important to do that. Democrats have some serious work to do on this issue. All right, we continue to await remarks from President Trump. I can tell you now that he has arrived at the venue. So we are literally just a few minutes away. That is the GOP retreat where they set their policy going forward. Uh, that's expected to start at any moment from the president. We'll bring you his remarks when he begins. Plus, new developments in the Russia investigation. Now the president's attorneys say they're not sure if special... President Trump is gearing up to deliver remarks at the annual GOP conference in West Virginia. Just moments from now, we'll bring you that live when it begins. This is the Wall Street Journal reports former Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe knew about thousands of new Hillary Clinton emails found on former Congressman Anthony Weiner's laptop about a month before then Director James Comey told Congress about them. Meantime, CNN reporting controversial FBI agent Peter Strzok helped draft the first cut of Comey's letter, notifying Congress of the decision to reopen the Clinton email investigation just days before the presidential election. And according to text messages Strzok sent agency lawyer Lisa Page, he also helped review those new emails and determined there was, quote, no new classified material. I'll let you draw the conclusions from all of that, Buck Sexton. Well, when you see that somebody so senior in the FBI is aware of an investigation of that level, that, that gravity for the country, and then you start to look at what the basic details of what you just discussed with Anthony Weiner's laptop, Huma Abedin, here you have classified information believed to be on a laptop, which is a can be a felony, by the way. It's, it's a violation of a whole bunch of different federal statutes. You have now a convicted sex offender who has the classified information on his laptop, or may have had the classified information on his laptop <laughs> you can't at the time. Even make that and, up. Uh, and, and, then, and then you realize <laughs> that the convicted sex offender felon who has the classified fel uh, felonious information on a random laptop, totally unsecured, is also the husband of the closest single advisor to the likely next, they believed at the time, president of the United States. And I just don't see how you sit on that for a month. I don't Wait, see well, how that's possible. Well, when you put it that way, you know, <laughs> yeah. Harris, as we've been covering this, the ins and outs of all this, and, and it does kind of get confusing at times. And you you have to keep track of it all. You're left kind of wondering, and I'm sure American people were left wondering, like, was anybody really doing their jobs and were they doing it the right way? Well, and, you know, I mean, Hillary Clinton had to, as uh, Secretary of State, uh, agree to the terms of and make sure she signed and understood what classified information was. She actually was in charge of determining whether or not classified information was born that way or should be classified. So she was what we would call in our business an expert. <laughs> so what you would want your expert to be able to do is also to delineate that information on their own personal devices. Mm -hmm. That would be really helpful if you could do that. So then the question becomes what you're asking. Was this uh, a level of incompetence? 
or was this something that was determined that would help her do her job? Mm. I mean, we still have a lot of questions all these months later. Well, don't forget, Andrew McCabe's wife was running for office and she yep. was getting campaign donations from Clinton Associates. Mm. I mean, that in and of itself to me is a massive red flag. It's a conflict of interest. There's no way that he so, wouldn't have some personal bias there. So now we find out he sits on this thing for a month. So Trish, again, do you think that they are just incompetent at their jobs and they don't understand no, I don't what think they're, they're signing when they say we get it and we know how to do it? No, I think it's far worse than that because to me, the fact that your wife is getting money from people associated with Hillary Clinton while your wife is running for office, you can't possibly it's an important you fact not, to be not have some bias Jessica going into that investigation. And if nothing else, something. it's the appearance it's of bias. Face. It's the no. appearance of impropriety. <laughs> Therefore, McCabe should have excused himself. I, I totally disagree. I think that we all live and work in a very big world here. And the idea that someone can't do their job because their wife is doing their job, especially when they are someone who has served, from what I understand, honorably in the FBI decades long, it, it just doesn't fly with me. I mean, we are dual working households. I mean, I, I don't know. But she's talking but, about recusal from one very But why should he have to? And there's no argument. Because it's an ethics issue. So, Jessica, but, why do you think he said? on it then again do we come back well, to he's just so incompetent he doesn't know how to do his job no Which, I, by the I, way I, if that's the case take him off like why well, is he involved at all I believe, at least from what we've understood here, that they were reviewing the emails. And I, I wonder how when any new information comes to light about Peter Strzok that doesn't feed the secret society narrative or the insurance policy narrative, we don't discuss it. Why were someone them who before was you pushing, tell Congress? That, I, what, why, why not tell so Congress? So that you, you know what you're talking about? Nate Silver wrote about how this event, Comey coming forward about these emails, was the thing that sealed Hillary Clinton's fate in terms of the polling and lost her the election. So when you're dealing with something that serious why not take some time and go through it before you take do that and why not the election as to how you handle I mean, if Comey this? hadn't bailed her out in the first place Whoa. she would have lost the election because the felony charges that she would have faced so mm -hmm. we could play this game all day Alrighty, so buck gets the last <laughs> word we're going to move on new developments in robert Mueller's russia investigation now cnn is reporting president trump's lawyers argue the special counsel has not yet met the requirements they believe are needed to interview a president in person they want proof that only the president can provide the information that Mueller's team is seeking. If denied an interview, Mueller could issue a subpoena leading to prolonged court battles. This, as the investigation is reportedly narrowing in on a phone conversation the president had with White House Communications Director Hope Hicks, where the two decided to release a statement saying the 2016 Trump Tower meeting between Donald Trump Jr. and Russians was about Russian adoptions. Plus, CNN reports the DOJ turned over documents to the special counsel relating to Attorney General Jeff Sessions' previous offer to resign from his post, and that President Trump asked Deputy AG Rod Rosenstein whether he was, quote, on my team during a White House meeting last December. There's a lot to this, Buck. Bottom line it for us. Well, you keep hearing about how there are these concerns about whether you can trust public officials, whether they can act in a way that doesn't have any politicization. And then I hear about the on my team comment and I say, OK, oh, I'm sorry, I hear about uh, on my team. And I think about the wingman comment that I believe Eric Holder made about Barack Obama when he was still the attorney general. And I, I just wonder at what, at what point does this just become a little bit absurd? I mean, at what point are we just refusing to accept that people do have political biases? They should recuse themselves whenever they're there's any appearance of impropriety. That's different than saying they're actually acting unethically. Mm -hmm. And we, I, I get these updates every day. You see them on the screens at CNN and other networks where it's just, this person is being interviewed in the Russia investigation. Do you think the, the president should sit down and well, talk to Mueller? No, I absolutely do not think the president should sit down and talk to Mueller because, and this is somebody who's actually I've worked in law enforcement for a short while, you never want to be in a position where you are going up against a trained prosecutor, as Mueller is, and hope that you don't get caught in some kind of a perjury trap. There's no underlying crime. So why should the president of the United States, who does have responsibilities beyond just feeding the news cycle for these liberal outlets, <laughs> why should the president put himself in so, possible legal jeopardy? Right. I, I, I do want to press in a little bit on your resume, because you didn't just work in law enforcement. You you were. Well, I was a CIA analyst, but yeah. I yeah, there spent we go. some time at the NYPD Intelligence Division, right. so that's the law enforcement side, but yes. All right, uh, Jessica? The president himself said that he was looking forward to talking to Bob Mueller. This all came up 
because of that. And there is, I completely agree with you for his own sake that he shouldn't do this. And this is one of those issues, I think, in society where we talk about anyone who doesn't want to have that conversation, that they're immediately guilty. That's not what's going on there. You don't want to incriminate someone else necessarily. And it's just not smart. Judge Napolitano made the case last week. It's just not smart for him to go in there and talk about it. So I don't know why the president was running around saying, I'd love well, to talk to Bob Mueller. Mueller I'm looking forward to it. Wait a minute, though. I'll tell you why. Look, uh, we have polling that shows that 72% of Americans would like to see the president sit down with Mueller. Oh, the I would like it, too. It's just but, bad but for him. But my point is the president knows that the American people now are anxious for that transparency to, to either put this to rest or do something. So then why it. isn't he doing he, it? Hold on a minute. But that never meant that his attorneys agreed that that would be a good idea. And the question that they're asking now, Trish, is a really important question. And that every attorney who represents somebody often asks, or at least in the bottom line wants to get to, and that is, is my client the only person that can help you get to the facts on this? Is there any, and, and we do this in journalism, we try to triangulate so that we don't burn a source. Mm -hmm. We try to come up with other ways to prove the facts, and if we know we have to go to only that source, then we will do it. And that's what a good attorney does for you. You also well, know, is he a target, a subject, or a witness, and what would be, the, un great and what would be the underlying sure, crime? Asking. And you've already seen with Mueller, they're looking for process crimes here. They are charging people for things that are not criminal Here's except for the process of lying about a non criminal And this is something that Judge Napolitano was bringing up, that, that he may get to the point, Mueller may get to the point where he demands that interview and the president may not have a choice, right? I mean, so that's what... Well, he can subpoena. So, uh, you know, you, and then it, he'd be it, under may, it may happen either way and maybe in some ways the president is better off going in um, willingly initially in part to put to rest some of these concerns as you point out Harris, so, that the American public has. Well and attorneys want to be able for the White House want to be able to have a bargaining chip so if you're saying you've got to prove to me that only he can give you those I mean they're, they're negotiating right now what the what the terms are going to be and speaking of which the president is about to speak.